Lithium deficiency is a potential common mechanism for the degeneration of the brain that leads to the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So that's the conclusion from a groundbreaking study just published in the journal Nature. So Alzheimer's disease is one of the leading causes of death worldwide, but we're still a bit unclear about exactly what drives it. So this compelling research points to a possible new mechanism, and it raises the potential of giving us a novel way to both detect and treat this debilitating disease. So let's unpack the study and consider whether it's time to start supplementing with lithium. So we've got a decent grasp on the process of brain decay that happens with Alzheimer's disease. So it involves two basic mechanisms. There's the buildup of the sticky protein fragments called amyloid plaques. So these plaques form outside the brain cells and they disrupt normal communication. Then there are twisted tangles of a protein called tau that build up inside the neurons and they also disrupt normal function. So together these problems trigger inflammation and eventually cell death. But what we aren't sure about is why exactly this process happens and what we can do to stop it. So we have learned that there are some genetic variations that make some individuals more at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but it's the environmental factors in particular that are poorly understood, because these are obviously critical, because we can't do anything about our genes, but we can modify our risk factors in our environment if we know what those risk factors are. So researchers have identified several environmental factors that seem to play a role in developing Alzheimer's disease, and one of those is levels of metals in the brain. So, so far, researchers have looked at things like the toxic effects of too much iron or copper, but there are various metals that are important for brain function, and what hasn't been looked at much yet is what happens when the normal levels of these metals get disrupted. So that's what the researchers in this latest study set out to explore, and they made a startling discovery. So the researchers first looked at tissue samples from human brains, so the samples came from people who had already died, and they compared samples from those whose brains were working normally compared to those whose brains had mild cognitive impairment and those with Alzheimer's disease, which represented a more severe decline. Then they assessed the levels of 27 different metals in these samples, and the tests turned out that one metal in particular stood out from all of the others, and that was lithium. Its levels were much lower than normal in the brains of those who'd either had mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Interestingly though, the levels of lithium in the blood looked normal for those with mild or moderate cognitive decline, so something was going on specifically in the brain that was disrupting the availability of lithium. But what was it? Well, based on earlier studies, they had some reasons to suspect that the amyloid plaques might be somehow involved. So they had a look at the lithium levels specifically in those plaques, and here they hit the jackpot. So lithium was concentrated within the amyloid plaques themselves, and the levels of those with Alzheimer's disease were higher than those with mild cognitive decline. So it appeared that the lithium deficiency was linked to cognitive decline in at least one way. As the amyloid plaques built up in the brain, they soaked up the lithium and reduced its availability to other parts in the brain. So that raises the question, is lithium deficiency itself a causal factor in the progression of Alzheimer's disease? In other words, do declining levels of lithium play a role in making the condition worse, or is it just correlated? Well, to find out, the researchers turned to mice. So they modified their diets to reduce the intake of lithium by 92%. So some of the mice in their experiments, they were a special type that were genetically prone to amyloid plaques. In these mice, the plaque showed up earlier and they grew more quickly when they were eating a low lithium diet compared to the mice who were eating a normal diet. And a similar thing happened in regular mice. So with lower lithium intake, the brains developed much higher levels of the proteins that form plaques. Low lithium diets also promoted the growth of the tau protein tangles within the neurons, and the negative effects of low lithium extended beyond Alzheimer's specific problems. So the researchers found that it also led to increased inflammation, the breakdown of the connections between the brain cells, and cognitive decline. So from these results, it looks like two things are going on. So first, not only do the plaques that form with Alzheimer's disease absorb the lithium and drop the levels in the surrounding brain tissue, but also low levels of lithium seem to speed up the formation of these plaques. There's a vicious feedback loop. So the implications of the study are huge. As the researchers note, we may have discovered a key mechanism that leads to the onset of Alzheimer's disease, but we have to be careful not to overinterpret a study on genetically altered mice that were fed a diet with extremely low levels of lithium. So do we have any human studies that back up the connections suggested by this mouse study? Well, we've known that there are connections between lithium and cognitive function for decades. So lithium used at higher doses has been used to treat bipolar disease for a long time. And I've got a few patients at my clinic who were prescribed lithium by their psychiatrists. And there have been some intriguing observational studies. So for example, researchers in Denmark they examined levels of lithium in drinking water along with the incidence of dementia, and there was an inverse relationship. So those diagnosed with dementia tended to have lower levels of lithium in their drinking water. 
and there was encouraging data from a survey of past participants in a study of lithium to treat mild cognitive impairment. The researchers contacted those who were still living from a trial that ended about a decade earlier, and the ones who had taken lithium during the trial they had better scores on measures of cognitive performance compared to those who hadn't taken it. But what about actual randomized clinical trials? Well, in two initial studies, lithium treatment unfortunately didn't improve cognitive function, but there's an intriguing reason as to why those earlier studies may not have found any benefits, and we'll return to that in a moment. Now, in three later studies, however, it was found to help. And a meta-analysis looked at the clinical trials of lithium and aticatinab, which was a treatment used for Alzheimer's disease. Now, it was a controversial medication that was briefly approved for this condition, but the analysis suggested that lithium was significantly more effective than that medication. So all of this raises a natural question. We've got some intriguing data suggesting a link between lithium deficiency and Alzheimer's disease. So should we consider supplementing with low-dose lithium while we wait for more conclusive data to come through? What's the benefit versus risk ratio, and what's the best form of lithium that we should consider? Well, the study that we began the video with shed some interesting light on these questions. So as we discussed, the researchers noticed that lithium, it gets bound to amyloid plaques. So they wondered whether there was a form of lithium that wouldn't bind as readily. So given what they knew about how the binding worked, they reasoned that lithium orotate might avoid being captured by the plaques better compared to lithium carbonate. So lithium carbonate is the form typically used in clinical settings. So they put that theory to the test in mice. Both forms of lithium, when placed in their drinking water, raised the levels in their blood about the same amount. But when they had a look at their brains, they saw a dramatically different picture. So those getting lithium carbonate, they ended up with much higher concentrations of lithium in their amyloid plaques. But in contrast, the mice who got the lithium orotate had lithium levels boosted in the regions of their brain that were free from plaques. And this difference made a huge impact when it came to addressing Alzheimer's disease. Lithium orotate had almost completely blocked amyloid formation and tau tangle accumulation. Lithium carbonate, on the other hand, did absolutely nothing. And even more exciting, lithium orotate was able to significantly reduce disease progression. Again, lithium carbonate had basically no effect. So the form of lithium that we use seems to be critical. And the study authors note that this is probably why those initial studies that didn't find any positive results with lithium treatment found those results. They were using a form that was bound too easily to the amyloid plaques. So as a result of this new study, we've got some intriguing evidence for three points. Number one, lithium deficiency, it might be an important driver of the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Number two, increasing lithium intake might help prevent and even reverse the damage behind Alzheimer's disease progression. And number three, one specific form of lithium, so lithium orotate, appears to avoid the capture by amyloid plaques and boosts the levels of lithium in healthy brain tissue. And all of that sounds like a really strong case for taking low-dose lithium orotate supplements. But here's why we might want to pause. So first, the existing research is quite limited. This is especially true when it comes to clinical trials. So we've only got a tiny bit of data here. So while the theory is compelling and it lines up with what we currently know from animal studies, we need to be cautious. Which brings us to the second point. We don't know what the optimal dosing is for lithium supplements. We do know that getting too much lithium is associated with a list of potentially serious side effects. And this is a major concern with treatment for bipolar disorder. So with low-dose treatment, the concern here wouldn't be as great, but there's still the potential of getting too much. And this is linked to a third point. We already get lithium from various sources. So remember that Danish study that looked at the levels of lithium in drinking water and what it did to the Danish people within that study. For all we know, we might be living in an area where our drinking water, in addition to other dietary sources, supplies us with adequate doses of lithium. And one study of food products even found that certain vegetables had levels of lithium high enough to raise concerns. So if we're already getting lithium, we likely wouldn't benefit from adding more, and that's why I'm not yet adding it to microvitamin. More robust, larger scale clinical trials are needed before any therapeutic recommendations can be made. So I, for one, will be keeping a really close eye on these developments, and I take this cautious approach because we're already getting lithium from our diet and our water supply, and we don't yet have enough data to accurately show a positive benefit versus risk ratio. But we don't need to wait on the results of these studies to take action to lower our dementia risks, because there are things that we already understand that can make a massive difference today. So in this next video here, I'll walk through some surprising impacts of dementia that we're already finding with two common medications that target type 2 diabetes.